hello and welcome to the first site cafe of the new academic semester. My name is Nadia Karim and I will be your moderator of this event, which is brought to you by the Office of the Vice President for Research here at KAUST. As you can see, we are still online due to COVID-19, but we do hope to change this soon in some capacity and get us back to our original interactive site cafe discussions. Today we have what I think is a great topic to get us started, and that is autonomous technology. Now I think when we say autonomous technology, most of us think of robots, if that's fair, but it does encompass much more than that. We're talking about things that function on their own without human intervention. But autonomous technology can be anything from the sliding door on your way into work or self-driving vehicles. Now here at KAUST, we do actually have autonomous shuttles on campus, the first ones of the kingdom to do so. But I think I should stop there as we are joined by three experts in the field who are going to tell us a lot more than I certainly can. We have joining us today, a Professor Jeff Shama, Professor Shihab Ahmed and Francis, or well known as Frank Malin. So you're all very welcome um, here at KAUST Sci Cafe. Jeff, I'm going to hand it over to you. Please do tell us about yourself and the work that you do here at KAUST with regard to autonomous technology. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and then uh, thanks for the, uh, you know, the opportunity for this discussion. I think it's a really exciting uh, topic indeed. Uh, so yeah, my name is Jeff Shama. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering here at KAUST and I'm also the principal investigator of the Robotics Intelligence Systems and Control Lab. I, I can talk a bit about what the lab does uh, in, in say later in the session, but I'd like to give a, a very brief overview of what I feel is the, uh, or view as the, the evolution of autonomy and autonomous operations in, in robotics. And so the traditional applications have been in, say, in manufacturing and industrial uh, robotics, where you had robots doing tasks like uh, pick and place, painting, welding, assembly. And the features of these environments is that they were very highly structured. And so uh, robots didn't really need an awareness of their surroundings because their surroundings were highly regulated and very uh, repeatable. Uh, and then you go from the manufacturing floor to the uh, field robotics, uh, leaving the manufacturing setting. And the usual expression for robotics applications here is that uh, they're going to be doing tasks that are dirty, dull, and dangerous. And so it could be environmental cleanup, infrastructure inspection, area monitoring, uh, even uh, diffusing uh, bombs, uh, exploration of mines, and then other uh, dangerous uh, places. Now we're seeing more unstructured environments uh, away from, the, again, the manufacturing uh, setting. Uh, but now the, uh, still with these uh, applications, you found a lot of remote operation by uh, humans to interpret the environment with uh, in growing but still limited uh, onboard uh, and situational awareness on the on, an autonomy on the robots. And what we're seeing most recently is much more of an evolution of operation in unstructured environments with more onboard the smarts, more onboard autonomy, but also proximity to humans is a big uh, game changer uh, uh, recent in, in recent applications. And so now you can think of this as a fluid human robot society. Robots are acting in close proximity, maybe even with physical contact with other humans. Autonomous vehicles are example, last mile delivery, domestic uh, assistive uh, robotics. And now these are very unstructured environments, uh, whether it's city streets or household uh, uh, rooms, agricultural fields. And, and this is really the most uh, now uh, recent expression of autonomy where now the onboard smarts is more and more and the human intervention and operation is, is less and less. Thank you, Jeff. Really nice to get a history of the evolution. Um, Shahab, I'll hand it over to you. Please introduce your yourself and uh, tell us what you do here at KAIS with regard to autonomous technology. Sure. So uh, my name is Shahab Ahmed. Uh, I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering uh, here at KAUST. And uh, my group, uh, the Mechatronics and Energy Systems Research Group, sort of uh, works on uh, you know, the sort of the intelligent integration of mechanical computing and electronics. Uh, to to produce uh, systems and subsystems that enable autonomy, right? So so we work on electric vehicle drivetrains uh, of different kinds that enable sort of a seamless integration between the vehicle and the charging infrastructure. Uh, we work on uh, the actuators that uh, enable robots to uh, to move around and carry and lift, uh, etc. Uh, uh, we work on uh, you know the power converters that uh, enable renewable integration 
into the grid, into the power grid uh, of, of, uh, of, of a city or of a country. So, uh, so we, we, that, that's sort of our area of expertise or interest. And, and again, it's uh, the, the, the evolution of sort of the, the relationship between autonomy and, and uh, electrification is very interesting because I think it's, uh, you know, people, you know, when they think of autonomous vehicles, they think of connected vehicles, they, they think of, you know, shared, uh, shared uh, vehicle fleets, et cetera. The, the electrification aspect doesn't really come up, but, uh, but when, you, when you think of a vehicle, for example, uh, you know, you know we, were, we were running on 12 volt batteries in a, in a, in a car, and any time you ask for autonomy, you're adding more sensors, you're adding more actuators to a vehicle, and you're requiring more power. So, so anytime you require this additional power, it's, this is where electrification comes in. So we produce these sort of novel devices that enable more efficient electrification of systems such as vehicles and integration of vehicles with the power system or the power grid. The power grid is a whole different ballgame as well, where you know, we, we work on renewables integration uh, into the grid. And, uh, to do that, uh, we, we develop power converters and, and controllers that autonomously uh, help operate uh, and, and power the power the, your devices on the grid. And uh, this this grid, of course, is, uh, is is a big mystery. You know, you know, we we you know, we take it for granted that we can plug in a, 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 an apparatus or a device into the wall outlet and have it working, or we turn on the power in a, in a room and we have light, but but really, when you think of it, uh, anytime you do that, uh, a generator somewhere is being fueled. So there's there's fuel being put into a generator anytime you do that. So so the, the power system or the power grid is is the world's biggest machine, and today it is it is run in a certain way at these central power plants where you know there is some level of autonomy in how we deliver power to the world, and uh, we will talk a little bit more later on on why we need more autonomy. Uh, when we go forward. Brilliant, thank you Shahab. Frank, if you would like to introduce yourself and tell us uh, what you do at KAIS with regard to autonomous technology. Yeah, thanks Nadia and uh, really excited to be chatting with uh, Jeff and Shahab. You know, both of those um, introductions are um, elements that uh, I am hoping to be discussing later on this year with them. Uh, my name is Frank Mallon. I'm um, the Oceanographic Specialist down at Seymour, which is the Coastal Marine Core Lab. Um, I've been here uh, about 11 years, and most of it on a ship uh, or underwater. And I like what Jeff was talking about, the evolution of autonomy. I've actually seen that. When, when I first came, I think we had one ROV or remotely operated vehicle, uh, basically a small robot that's tethered up to the ship, and you would sit on the ship and, and drive it. But over the years, um, KAUST has expanded. We've uh, procured um, through the Professor Bert Jones Group um, autonomous gliders, which you can now operate at home on your mobile phone to things like the Remus 100, uh, which is an AUV, which you program and you send it off and it's only li limited by its power. And that's something, um, you know, when you talk about electrifying, the more sensors that you put on, what Sh Shabab was talking about, it's something that you really have to be mindful of. Um, you're limited by the, um, the, the power supply in your batteries to what sensors you can use. And again, um, the, the sensors that are being developed now, they're giving the autonomous vehicle much more spatial awareness. It needs to know where the bottom is. It needs to know what it's looking for. Is it looking for oil and gas? Is it looking for pollution? You can actually do, uh, program it to um, have the sensor take over the navigation of the vehicle. And that's something that's very excitable. Uh, you know, it's a field that I'd love to get into as well. So that's pretty much it for me. We'll, we'll talk more about um, uh, the, the benefits and challenges later, I guess. Thanks, Frank. And then you just talked about the, the evolution that you've actually seen, because you've been here quite some time, haven't you? In, in yeah. Saudi Arabia itself. Yeah, 11 years. Well, I grew up in Saudi. My father worked uh, in the middle of the desert for Al Marai. And um, I've actually been at their plant. We, we managed to do a visit back. And the autonomy that they have in their logistics and shipping department it is unbelievable. <laughs> but you've been 11 years at KAIS and you've seen that evolution. That's really something. Yeah. So, OK, how can we benefit from autonomous technology? I mean, do we need it? Jeff, maybe you can start us off with that one. Yeah, there's uh, lots of clear benefits 
uh, to, uh, to autonomy. And, and so one can think of, uh, for example, uh, say safety, uh, increased efficiency, uh, improved quality of life. Uh, so some examples of these, let's, let's take for example, uh, safety. There's already a lot of autonomous features in say the cars that we drive. Uh, so we're, we're all familiar with cruise control. Now there's more advanced adaptive cruise control uh, that will speed up and slow down depending on traffic uh, conditions, uh, say collision uh, warning systems, lane keeping systems, anti-lock braking is another type of autonomy where it's taking a decision. If we want to take a broader view that autonomy is taking a decision away from a human and giving it to a machine, then anti-lock braking is a very nice example in that you're asking to brake hard, but the machine, the automobile, is figuring out how to do that most effectively in a uh, safe way. Uh, traction control is another example. So these are all examples of autonomy for the sake of uh, safety. And then there's increased, increased efficiency, whether it's autonomous transportation, uh, uh, fleets of uh, autonomous uh, vehicles uh, for more efficient uh, transport of people and products uh, throughout the uh, uh, community, agriculture to uh, improving uh, yield. Now there's this notion of precision out agriculture where we can use uh, autonomous vehicles to, to see what the field needs where and most urgently and perpetually monitor the, uh, the situation. Uh, improved quality of life, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about an aging society worldwide and there's a promise of, say, domestic assistive robots uh, to, uh, to uh, help with autonomy there. Uh, also, bringing infrastructure to remote areas. We talk a lot about smart cities, but there's also the notion of smart villages uh, and using autonomy, again, to bring infrastructure that otherwise would have been very uh, costly uh, to bring and so to make a more level playing field. Uh, worldwide and, and address uh, such uh, kind of, uh, uh, inequities in, uh, in wealth. So I think you know, there's all kinds of benefits uh, to autonomy. Now you mentioned the need for autonomy as well. And you know, there, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to be a little bit cynical. Okay? So we've heard about, say, same-day delivery uh, with, uh, with electronic uh, commerce. I mean, do I really need my sneakers today? Uh, and, and so that's, you know, one can argue about those kinds of applications of uh, autonomy. And here I could quote a uh, line from a lecture of Daniel Kahneman, a Nobel laureate and, uh, and psychologist, who was talking about human happiness. And, and he said in this lecture that he grew up without air conditioning and he doesn't remember being miserable. Uh, but now if you take it away from us and we'll be miserable. And so, yeah, the need is an evolving, uh, kind of evolving uh, notion of what we need or don't need. And I think that as the applications come, uh, we will be, expect that as part of society and it will become uh, a need. So that's, that's a, like I said, an evolving uh, uh, situation. Thank you for your honesty. Here at Sci Cafe, we love that kind of uh, cynical conversation. There always has to be uh, the devil's advocate going on. Um, Shahab, the same to you then. How can we benefit from autonomous technology and do we need it? Uh, sure, sounds good. So I'll, uh, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll start with the, do we need it first in, in the context of power systems and power grids. Uh, I, again, I think it's, uh, it's, in this case, I think it's a, it's a necessary, it's a, it's a, it's a must. We, we cannot live without it, I would say. Uh, the, the power system today has, has has quite a bit of autonomy. I mean, as as, as I mentioned, it's uh, you know just turning on a switch will put fuel in a generator. So so there is definitely a lot of autonomy happening in the power system, but again, it's it's concentrated at maybe power plants uh, or or limited to a few other locations around the city. Uh, but as the power system evolves and uh, as as we integrate more renewables. As uh, as electric vehicles sort of uh, you know sort of prevail uh, on our streets and and, and chargers uh, are placed on the different corners of uh, uh, of, our, of our city, uh, there is uh, this continuous need to to add different you know increased autonomy to the power system. You can think of it as you know today we have these large batteries at you know, a few locations around the city, and these batteries are sort of controlling. So how much power we receive at our houses. And these batteries, you know, there are people sitting there looking at how much or forecasting how much load you are requiring in order to sort of adjust or fine tune the different large batteries around the city in order to feed the power to the loads that we, you know, the, the industries, the houses uh, that, that are requiring these, these loads. 
but then you know think of the think of adding you know billions of these batteries around the city right you cannot have individuals at a power plant sitting and controlling these billions of batteries around the city and these these can can be sort of the wind power plants or or the wind turbines on uh, in, in, the, in a backyard of a large uh, house or or the photovoltaic panels on top of your house or uh, or, or a community solar project uh, all these will be sort of like these different batteries and and without autonomy uh, you will never be able to send enough power from these sources into the grid. So, so our ability, the ability of the grid to to host more renewables and allow us to to be good stewards of our of our you know uh, fossil fuels uh, and, and and utilize uh, renewables in in a way that that benefits our economy and benefits our uh, environment. I think will require inevitable uh, integration of you know a large level of autonomy. Uh, in the power system. So I, I really think it's a need in the power system, it's not a luxury. Thank you, Shahab. Yeah, it does sound like with the ever-growing populations and the ever-growing cities, um, autonomous technology is something we most certainly need for uh, the grid to make it smarter. Frank, with regard to your underwater expeditions, um, how do you benefit or how would you benefit from an autonomous technology? Do you need it? Well, um, as a commercial diver, scientific diver, the last thing I want is a machine to come and take my job. <laughs> but um, uh, what I can do underwater is very, very limited. You know, it's you know, very fine tuned. I'm limited to earth supply, you know, tables, you name it. Uh, and the development of machines, uh, ROVs, AUVs over the last 30, uh, 20, even the last five years is unbelievable. It's just exploding. And you can now go and buy your own AUV for less than $10,000 and it can go down to 500 meters. Um, five, 10 years ago, that was res restricted to military. Uh, and autonomous vehicles, either on the surface or subsea, they can just cover so much more um, uh, survey area. They can get into the extreme uh, environments uh, here in the Red Sea. Um, it's, it's less than 12 hours uh, seal. We have um, the deepest part of the Red Sea an extreme environment, um, Atlantis too deep. We have th deep thermal vents coming up. We have a, a sea line a subsea lake, which is, I think it's over 69 degrees Celsius. There's no way I can get into that. That's 2.5 kilometers deep. Um, we, we need to get autonomous vehicles into that. Um, and that's something I'm, I'm definitely working on. So yeah, um, it, it, it's, it's a force multiplier. You know, I can do, I can work five, 10 times faster. I can survey so much more um, ground uh, using autonomous vehicles. And it's not just about the, the vehicle that's collecting the data, it's the processing. So you can see behind me that this is part of uh, offshore Jeddah. Your little um, bit go behind you almost. Almost. Lights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, the software that I use to do the processing of the 3D data, um, we're using new um, uh, software that can, uh, you can teach it what to look for. If you're, if you're looking for fish schools, if you're looking for um, shipwrecks on the seabed, you can train the algorithm to go through, and, and we're talking terabytes of data. So it, it's saving me not only data acquisition time, but processing and final product for the scientist. So it, for me, it's a game changer. Brilliant. And then there's huge benefit then for the kingdom, even if you're surveying the Red Sea, you're oh, going yeah. to places that you've never gone to before if you're using autonomous technology. You yeah. actually said uh, AUV, so what is it, autonomous unmanned vehicle? Yeah, so autonomous unmanned vehicles, they, they look like torpedoes um, with a very, very um, uh, expensive navigation systems inside and uh, autonomous uh, sensors that will uh, guide it, you have bottom locking, uh, DVLs, you, you know, there's just so much in it and uh, again limited by batteries. But one thing that I'm, I'm in discussion with the company in the UK is to have uh, an acoustic um, uh, receiver. You know, I'm thinking of the benefit to the kingdom. We have a, an agreement with the Aircraft Investig uh, Investigation Bureau. So we're essentially want to put a black box uh, sniffer on these low cost AUVs and it, God forbid there's an accident, we can launch swarms of these um, low cost AUVs roughly in the area and they can sniff out the black box and then you can, you can bring in your salvage. 
not just um, uh, aircraft uh, black boxes, but you can do it for oil spill. You know, and we can send out them to locate the source of a, a, a pipeline leak or um, a ship that has sunk. You name it, the, the possibilities are endless. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, oil spills, environmental monitoring, and, you know, understanding or exploring the Red Sea, the unknown. Yeah, absolutely, the possibilities are endless. Fantastic. So I guess then my next question would be, what will the future of autonomous technology look like? Um, and what are the current challenges? Maybe, Frank, I know you, when we chat about this before, you mentioned, you know, with the, the Red Sea, it's quite salty. And um, the power for the autonomous technology is, uh, is not at its, its best at the moment. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I would love to see some kind of uh, self-generating power source, you know, maybe a, um, a battery uh, powered by seawater. And I know there's lots of companies in the world that have started the research and there is patents out, um, but maybe it's something that a hybrid, you know, for our super sea line um, conditions that we have here. And also we, we can bring in solar energy. Um, I've done a little bit of research on that and there is solar panels that still work you know just 50 centimeters under the water we could have our autonomous vehicles you know a bit like whales coming up to um catch that breath of air we could have our autonomous vehicle to come up just just below the surface uh, to charge up its batteries and then go back down so yeah that, that's something i'm very interested in, in exploring brilliant and um, in terms of the future of autonomous technology and the current challenges jeff you mentioned safety earlier could you talk to us a little bit more about that? Well, uh, with uh, in, in talking about the future, you can mention a bit what's the present uh, in, in terms of how much autonomy is already around us, and then and then we can see how high the bar is set for future uh, applications. Uh, you know, I mentioned the uh, autom automotive applications of low-level autonomy, which is growing and growing with with now higher-level autonomy and the, and the presence of uh, of uh, autonomous uh, vehicles on the roads. And with commercial air travel from a few moments after takeoff to a few moments before landing, it's all on autopilots. And so we're already relying on autonomous technology there. Uh, when we do get goods in our homes uh, in e-commerce, a lot of uh, warehouses have robotic uh, processing of, of and packaging and, and sorting. So we're already relying on autonomy there. And I don't know how many of us have a Roomba in the house, but that's really the, that is the, actually the most widely deployed uh, domestic uh, or robot of any sort, uh, in fact. Uh, so that's already uh, there. And so for the future, you know, we you, you mentioned the issue of safety and, and that's a real challenge. Now we're going to have human robot interaction. And now how do you certify uh, the safety? And this is a big issue with, with uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, they say it's about, uh, you know, I, I forget the numbers like uh, say 10 out of a uh, fatalities out of a billion miles driven uh, for humans and that's uh, not the case even the testing is not there uh, for autonomous vehicles how do you certify that and there's a very interesting tension between certification and autonomy in that with autonomy you want a, a system to be able to interpret and react to its environment uh, with certification you want reliable behaviors and and so how do you have the combination how do you how do you address the tension of adaptability to a uncertain environment and certainty for certification and that's a big challenge that uh, the industry is facing uh, going forward yeah excellent points and i think as well you know a few of us think of the future of autonomous technology i definitely think about that will smith movie i robot where the robots take over the world <laughs> We are going to have to slowly integrate with autonomous technology, but what the future holds, I think, uh, is uh, <laughs> it's probably not the Will Smith movie, but it's it's something else. Um, Shahab, maybe the same question to you. What does the future of autonomous technology look like and what are the current challenges, maybe with regard to your grid? Sure. So uh, definitely with regard to the grid, uh, the, 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 the future autonomous technology will definitely lead the grid towards this uh, capability to host 100% renewables, right? So, so the idea of being able to run a full grid on 100% renewables is really going to be, you know, is, is going to be enabled by 
autonomy of the different devices that we put around the power system. So whether these are photovoltaic converters, whether they're wind power converters, whether they're energy storage converters, or or merely uh, you know boxes that are more like energy routers that are moving power between different places to to control the power flow in order to maintain a certain level of uh, uh, you know con control over what's happening uh, around the power system. So so I think uh, you know. There is definitely uh, a big role for renewables and, and autonomy in the future of the power system. We are not there yet. I think uh, certain some countries have have reached 70, 80 percent on a few days a year of uh, of renewable hosting capacity. Uh, however, in order to be able to to run countries or large cities 100 uh, percent on renewables, uh, autonomous technology on the grid is is definitely. Uh, it's definitely a big area of, of interest and you know, a lot of research is going into that. Uh, with regards to, to what we are interested in, as, as our, our group is interested in, is also uh, finding out how to demonstrate that at scale. So uh, we are definitely uh, very interested in looking at building connected digital twins uh, or, or, or digital replicas of the physical systems. So this is something people do today anyway for, for different disciplines. So we, we build we build models of a robot, we build models of a, of a gas turbine, we build models of a power plant, uh, we build uh, models of everything that we work on. And, and we use these models to, to look at what happened in the past, uh, to predict uh, why things, why failures happen. And we also use these models to plan interventions in the future. So, so what we are looking at right now is, is how do you build a, a digital twin of digital twins, right? So, so how do you build... Uh, something that, that interacts with many kinds of digital twins and, and brings physics to scale so that when you implement policy, you can see what the effect of policy is virtually before you try it out on a real city. So, so really at, uh, this, this idea of implementing science at scale and uh, is, is going to be enabled by autonomy for sure. And uh, it's something that we really want uh, to be looking at over the next uh, 10 years in our in our group and and we are looking at working collaborating with many of the CALS faculty in order to to bring this vision to, to reality because it, again we're if you want to bring science to scale you're looking at bringing many different disciplines together at the same time yeah. thank you shahab definitely there's a lot of challenges there but um that's why we have you three here coast to uh <laughs> solve those so um you know, there's technology all around, there's autonomous technology all around us, right? It's in our everyday lives. Can we give some examples of what autonomous technology might be? So, uh, you, know, and, and then, you know, I've been talking about the grid a lot, but, you know, another area that's very near and dear to my heart is, uh, is the oil and gas uh, industry. I, I used to work for, for Schlumberger, which is an oil field services company, and we used to develop products for oil and gas drilling, exploration, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, I have a plaque back here with, with a you know, 3D printed version of a small robot. I mean, okay, this was about uh, 10 feet long, maybe, or, or 10 to 12 feet long in reality. But uh, this was a robot that we used to, to convey, you know, put sensors in oil wells. And uh, it, it used to be putting sensors in oil wells thousands of kilometers under the ground. So you can imagine, you know, in order to do that, in order to drill a well like that, in order to convey sensors to a location like that, the level of autonomy required to make that happen is, is unbelievable. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, when I left, they, you know, my, my colleagues, they 3D printed smaller versions of the, of the robot that we were working on. I was working more on the electrification part of it. So there's a small motor here that, uh, that, they, that they used to work in 2007, but it no longer spins. And then the, all the, the, the electronics that I burned trying to, to develop the electrified drivetrain uh, for, uh, for our robot uh, is also they sort of glued some of these components on there. Yeah. So, it's, uh, so, so again, it's, it's been there for in the oil and, in oil and gas industry for ages. I mean, since I mean, this, is, this, was, this plaque has been with me since 2007. So yes, 13 years with a plaque that uh, I really uh, like and uh, hold dear to my heart. Uh, and, and again, it's, it's continuously evolved. So we are continuously uh, in the oil and gas industry trying to drill deeper, drill faster, convey sensors to deeper locations, convey more sensors, convey sensors autonomously, 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the level of autonomy required in, in the oil and gas industry also amazes us, uh, but some of us don't really see that. Yeah, so. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing. That was excellent. Jeff, would you like to add something? Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about what the, the Risk Lab is, is doing. And in particular, we have an interest in swarm robotics and in multi-robot systems. Uh, Frank had already alluded to swarm robotics, where you have many robots, uh, autonomous systems working together. And the advantage is that you can have either do things that a single uh, platform can do, or you can get kind of complex behaviors through uh, a multitude of simple, inexpensive uh, of platforms. And so it's a multiplier on capabilities. And this area has sees a lot of, uh, of bio inspiration uh, with uh, you know, ants being the, the, uh, the usual example, but flocks, schools, uh, and packs of, of, uh, of different types of uh, wildlife all give this uh, kind of inspiration of what can be done with many uh, versus one. That stated, there's another bio inspiration video that I show and when I talk about distributed robotics, and uh, I show a, a video of a baseball dropping between three multi-million dollar athletes. And that when you have many trying to achieve a task, then there's the possibility of a miscoordination where one could have done it, but because there were three, they weren't able uh, to do it. So there's capabilities that are enhanced by multi-robot and swarm robotics, but there's also a big, big challenge in coordination uh, so that we don't have uh, miscoordination. I do want to mention, comment on your iRobot uh, you know, point there. I, I think, you know, yes, uh, you know, there's all of this uh, kind of doomsday or robotic dystopia in, in science fiction, uh, but perhaps a more pressing uh, issue is a human taking over an autonomous system so that it, with malicious intent. Uh, so it's not that the robots will figure that out, but another human will figure out how to use autonomous systems in a way that they weren't intended to use. There have been examples of that already of people hijacking, say, uh, you know, we think about getting a virus on our computer. We don't think about getting a virus on the braking system of our car. And, uh, but there, you know, that can happen. And as things are more autonomous, then they can be, uh, you know, susceptible to that. And that's an area where actually Kaos is making a big investment in, in cybersecurity and it expresses itself uh, through, uh, you know, autonomous systems and, and security. So I'm still worried about humans uh, more than robots. Thank you for your two cents. That's brilliant. Um, Frank, do you have anything to add just when we're talking about autonomous technology in our everyday lives? I mean, it is very much all around us already. Yeah, well, well, for me, um, it's the, I keep going back to the processing of the data. Um, I've been started out uh, maybe 20, over 20, well, too long ago, I won't say how many decades, uh, doing archaeology and using GIS. So uh, just you know, um, mapping geographical information, and that I've, that has evolved through time, and uh, to pick up ArcGIS now or some of the offshore um, uh, hydrographic survey and programs, you have to do maybe a, a two-week course just to go through the manual and, and the steps. But once you do that, the amount of processing that uh, it will do for your data, um, it just keeps increasing, um, it seems exponentially every year. You have to buy the new version of the software and then the amount of time that you spend uh, actually at the computer processing is, is being reduced. Um, soon I won't have a job in the office. You know, I won't have a job sub C and I won't have a job in the office, almost. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, so we have um, a few questions in from the audience, actually, in fact, um, but I think we just got time for this one, so I'm going to pick. How important is autonomous technology or how important will it become after COVID-19 in the post-pandemic world, inside and outside Coast? Would anybody like to answer to that? Uh, well, there's a hint of it in the current COVID world, and uh, in that uh, even uh, one of my former students is now a researcher in, in the UK, and they were working on autonomous, uh, say, disinfection of spaces. Uh, and so it, it, we're in, in now look at us having this uh, this video uh, Sci Cafe and and not blinking an eye. It's part of the like they say the new normal. I think there'll be a reevaluation of what really where human intervention has to be. Uh, or where it can be uh, kind of replaced with autonomous operations. And again, here with, uh, you know, for the sake of, of safety, uh, to not expose uh, humans in a way that they could have uh, uh, kind of avoided. 
Excellent. Thank you. And then for the same for, um, we'll pick something simple like shipping. Um, globally, during the, the COVID crisis, it has been an absolute disaster for um, seafarers and crews on ship. If they were on board their vessels uh, when the COVID started, they weren't allowed off. Um, Many of them um, were three or six months over their uh, normal um, you know, stay on board, highly stressful for their families. Some of the ships they actually got, or even offshore oil platforms, they had COVID on board and um, you know, you know, really disruptive to shipping. And I know for the past, past five, 10 years, they've been working on autonomous uh, merchant vessels. So when you make your Amazon order, and um, if you're on land, you might get the aerial drone delivering it, but how does it get to your country? It's done by shipping and each of those large vessels, there's 30 or 40 people on board. Um, uh, countries like Norway, they, they've actually uh, built and um, trialed their the first um, autonomous merchant vessel. You're talking huge saving on fuel safety. You know, we don't have to have um, people on board. You can, uh, it's really good for the environment as well. You know, you might not be under any time constraint to get back to port, to uh, rebunker, refuel. You can slow the vessel down. You can start looking at zero emissions. You know, um, you know I think that is going to be a game changer. You know, rout routine shipping um, is going to become autonomous. And I was looking at the UK, uh, there's a company launching um, a vessel called the Mayflower and it will be doing the first transatlantic journey um, with a completely autonomous ship. So I think that's happening towards the end of this year. So I'm really looking forward to that. Wow, thank you. Shahab. Sure. Um, so again, uh, we were looking at uh, one topic uh, related to, uh, to this, uh, to the effect of COVID-19 on autonomy in the power system as well. I think it's, uh, I think one, one area of, uh, you know, of, of a big interest is in power system is, you know, planning. So, so the way we, you know, we, we plan our, our electricity generation based on forecasts. And uh, what happened during uh, COVID is, is uh, forecasts were way off. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, typically you have the generators on you, you, you don't, you don't expect to have a generator on you know on standby all the time so typically the utilities or the or, or you know, the utilities contract with certain generators to be online to sort of take up or some some you know some power surges if you want ups and downs of this and then some larger generators who, that will take base load power who should be available and running uh, all the time so so again we were you know the, the world was running in a certain way and the contracts were in place and uh, generators were on standby in different locations based on forecasts. And, and COVID-19 comes and the, the forecasts were, were way off. I mean, it's uh, the, the difference between uh, the, the, what, what electricity we demanded and how much we were able to supply was very different. And, and this becomes uneconomical to, to run power systems in this fashion. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, again, here's where, again, autonomous uh, forecasting, uh, uh, the importance of forecasting and autonomy in this, uh, in this uh, area of power system operation and planning is, is very important. And I think the utilities are looking at that in a very different way right now. Uh, I think there's a lot, of, a lot more interest and a lot more emphasis on this post uh, COVID-19 because of the, the, what happened with the forecasts. So I think autonomy is uh, definitely going to play a big role in, uh, in uh, power system operation and planning in the future. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay, well, I think uh, maybe in the interest of time, I'm, I'll leave it there unless any, any of you want to say anything further. We're good. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much, guys. Thank you for, for being here today. Um, and I'm pretty sure our audience listening are in all of the capabilities of autonomous technology. Um, for, the, for our listeners, if you want to learn more about KAIS research, you can go to discovery.kais.edu.sa and you can even sign up for our bi-weekly newsletters. Um, our newest edition of KAIS Discovery should be online and interactive by the end of the week. And if you want to revisit older site cafes, where in fact, pre-COVID, we were in front of live audiences, you can just go onto our YouTube or Facebook, Facebook uh, online channels. So thank you very much for listening and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.